On July 29, we camped at Fort Alvesleben in Metz. The fort was west of the Moselle and offers a distant view of the picturesque Moselle Valley. In the fort, we found old batteries of German Krupp guns from the early 20th century. There was even ammunition for them. They were stored, neatly laid out next to the cannons. The inventory of the cannons was also of German origin. German artillerymen were forced to surrender these guns, as well as the lands of Lorraine and Alsace, conquered by Prussia in 1871, to the French in 1918-1919-19. After much labour and effort, we managed to adapt the fort to accommodate the troops. The fortress was to be a training camp for the newly created reconnaissance unit left stand at Adolf Hitler. I was entrusted with its formation in August. The basis of the units could be formed by the 15th Motorized Company, a platoon of armoured vehicles and a platoon of liaison motorcyclists of the former regiment. I was allowed to select additional personnel from the Motorcycle Replenishment Battalion at Elwang. I didn't have to do a long search at Elwangen. The young motorcycle riflemen wanted to join the combat units and were glad to leave their rear barracks. Fine, sturdy young soldiers surrounded me as soon as I asked if there were any volunteers. They were young men who had just turned 18 and had only been soldiers for six weeks. Within days, the new battalion in Metz was manned and began an intensive training program. The young boys were up to the task. They enthusiastically followed the instructions of their instructors and developed into a steel-hardened team. The old battlefields of the Franco-Prussian War of 1870-1871 at Marsley Tour and St. Priva and Gravelot became a training area for motorcyclists and scouts on armoured vehicles. In the years following the defeat of Germany in World War II, a lot of nonsense has been written about the Waffen SS and especially about their composition. I think that the reader should get an idea of the origin and social composition of a typical SS unit. The average age of soldiers was 1935 years. Non-commissioned officers had an average age of 25.76 years. The soldiers of the unit had a total of 450 brothers and sisters. All regions of the Reich were represented. It can rightly be said that these troops represented a cross-section of German society and were neither a unit of the offspring of important persons nor mercenaries. 48 officers, non-commissioned officers, and soldiers of this magnificent company were killed in the six months from July 10 to December 31, 1941. Another 122 were wounded during the same period. In the heavy defensive battles near Rostov in December 1941, the company was reduced to a platoon. How dare today's public figures call these honest and ready for self-sacrifice young men soldiers of the party? These guys fought for Germany and, of course, did not die for the National Socialist German Workers' Party, which ruled the country in 1933-1945. In the fall of 1940, I was seconded to a staff officer training course in Muchlasen in Alsace. The chief instructor of the course, Lieutenant General Bieler, commander of the 73rd Infantry Division, was excellent. During the course, I got to know a couple of colleagues, Colonel Hitzfeld and Major Stifferter, with whom I would later experience several serious situations together in Greece and Russia. At this time, live standout units and units were practicing Operation Sea Lion and practicing sea landing. The Moselle River was a favorite place for training. Under conditions of secrecy, the training switched to combat operations in mountainous terrain. We raced on motorcycles at breakneck speed on the steep slopes of the Muzzle Hill. The terrain surrounding the fortress with its high walls and moats looked like a circus. We even practiced climbing up and down the rocks with motorcycles and anti-tank guns. By spring, we expected to be a well-trained unit, ready to fight in any conditions. Soldiers, non-commissioned officers and officers worked with heavy weapons as a team and harmonized like clockwork. Colonel General Blaskowitz in his speech praised our efforts. General von Korsfleisch spoke in the same vein when we were inspected at Metz for the last time. The unit was ready for action and awaiting orders. Balkans. During World War I, the Germans had a tough time on the southeastern flank. In the fall of 1916, 
at the very time when we were making the bloodiest sacrifices in the West, on the sum in the East against General Brusilov's Russian Southwest Front, and in the South at Isonzo, the Allied powers completed the encirclement of Germany as a result of Romania entering the war on their side. For almost three long years, the Central Powers fought the Allied army in the rugged mountains of Macedonia, but only in September 1918, the forces of the Allied coalition under the command of General Franchi Despiri managed to break through the defences of the Germans and Bulgarians. With 29 divisions of the Allies, he went to the Danube, thus deciding the fate of our Allies. What role the Balkans were to play in this war in the spring of 1941? one could only guess. What was clear was that Winston Churchill again had a decisive influence on British strategy. It was he who had organised the landings at Gallipoli in 1915 and then at Thessaloniki. In the spring of 1941, London kept expeditionary forces in the Mediterranean on alert and then landed them in Greece. In mid-February, British Foreign Secretary Eden and General John Dill, Chief of the British General Staff, were in Athens to discuss the deployment of British troops in Greece. In January, the first units of German regular troops entered Romania. These soldiers, said to be from training units, found a warm welcome from the population. At the beginning of February, we too received orders to march. No one knew where this march would lead. We crossed the Rhine near Strasbourg and then followed the marvellously beautiful terrain of southern Germany into Bohemia. After passing Prague, we headed straight south and the next morning saw the outline of Budapest. Continuing through Pashto, our train approached the Romanian border. We became acquainted with the Transylvanian Germans, mostly Saxons and their beautiful country near the Hungarian-Romanian frontier, and were welcomed with extraordinary hospitality and cordiality at Kronstadt, Hermannstadt and many other prominent towns and villages in the Carpathians, which had long been inhabited by Germans. Our troops were quartered in the Kimpulung district. This formerly quiet station of the narrow gauge railroad was completely transformed. Everywhere there was a flurry of activity. In the very first hour of our march along the road an incident occurred to me which had an echo for the future. A Romanian lieutenant colonel who was cursing bad roads asked me to pull his small car out of the mud. There was a woman sitting in the car, obviously in a lot of pain. I quickly forgot about the incident. However, in 1943 in Doberitz Krampnitz, a Romanian colonel came up to me and greeted me warmly. He kept telling his comrades that I was the saviour of his wife and son. It took me quite a while to remember what he meant. The Romanian told me that when the car got stuck, his wife was on her way to the maternity hospital and was about to give birth. They arrived at the maternity hospital just in time and the wife gave birth to a son. We naturally celebrated our reunion in Germany. After a few weeks of parking in Kimpilung, we marched south to Bulgaria on muddy roads with deep ruts. The tracks of the tanks were sinking deeper and deeper into the ground and the repair columns were working ceaselessly. Air wide expanses with almost no elevations or wooded areas could be seen on either side of the road. From time to time we passed another poor village in which there was nothing else but a well and a few mud huts deeply embedded in the ground with a few windows open to all winds. Then one morning we saw a broad earthy brown ribbon of the slowly flowing Danube. To the south of the Danube the towering mountains of Bulgaria peaked through the misty haze. The sun was pouring its mercilessly scorching rays on the land when we entered Bulgaria over a bridge built by our military engineers. The Bulgarians greeted us joyfully. Many memories of World War I had been awakened, and Bulgarian peasants proudly showed us German awards. The march over the infamous road to Shipka Pass was unforgettable. Dangerous steep turns of the narrow road were nevertheless overcome swiftly under the supervision of repair teams. When on the ascents nothing could help, Bulgarians lent their draft bulls. The long columns rolled steadily southward, past Sofia into the Strumitsa Valley. There was a danger of crashing on the sharp ledges of rocks on the road. Drivers struggled to fit their heavy vehicles into the bends from the narrow mountain roads 
covered with a thick layer of dust. These roads, with their potholes, steep ascents and descents, and turns that demanded the maximum possible from the machines and drivers, had not seen such a huge amount of traffic for many days. In the Strumica Valley, a 20-kilometer traffic jam was formed, which became a particularly serious hindrance to the movement of our troops. The sappers and military engineers built a new road, all the while leveling it, blasting rocks and building new bridges. The danger of delaying the advance of the troops soon passed. The columns quickly crossed the valley and spread out over several valleys. High mountain ranges, hidden canyons, and wide valleys effectively concealed the huge troop formations. Large quantities of fuel, ammunition, and other supplies were stockpiled near the roads. The convergence march was complete. The assault companies were ready. Meanwhile, antique German circles, incited by the British, seized power in Belgrade. During the uprising on the night of March 26-27, the pro-German government was overthrown, and Prince Regent Paul was forced to leave the country. As a result, the situation in the Balkans changed dramatically. After the coup in Belgrade, Hitler had already decided to eliminate the Yugoslav threat to our flank. In addition to the 1st Panzer Group of General von Kleist and the 2nd Army of General von Wietsch, which were to break through to Belgrade and occupy the north of Yugoslavia, the 12th Army under the Commander Field Marshal List struck in the south of Yugoslavia and then advancing into Greece. The 12th Army had 16 divisions plus the Greater Germany Infantry Regiment and our SS Lee Brigade. Hitler ordered the attack on Yugoslavia on April 6, following the April 5 non-aggression and friendship pact between the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. The hot spring day was drawing to a close. The heat in the Strumica Valley was almost unbearable. Because of the events in Yugoslavia, we moved to the northern part of the valley to Kustendil which is located 20 kilometers from the Bulgarian-Yugoslavian border. The 9th Armoured Division had already reached this border town and had orders to march on Skopje and, if possible, take this important hub city. We were to follow the 9th Panzer Division almost all the way to Skopje, then turn south and follow the Greek border through Prelep and Bitola. My reinforced battalion formed up in the square in front of me. Darkness enveloped us as I told my comrades the essential details of our upcoming operation. They listened in silence as I explained the mission of our forward detachment and pointed out the anticipated problems. I also felt it necessary to remind them of the fierce battles fought by our fathers in World War, in the mountains of Macedonia and the capture of Manastir, a city for which a sea of blood had been spilled then and which was now one of our first targets. We wanted to take it swiftly and suddenly. When I spoke of this, I felt for the first time the boundless trust that bound me to my soldiers. I could lead them into hell and they would follow me. The night was damp and warm. There was little talk, and most of the soldiers were smoking. Each wanted to be alone with his thoughts just before the operation. The silvery moon cast a dim light on the soldiers, who were bent over, walking beside their motorcycles. The steep, bare mountainside sloped ominously upward, revealing itself to us as dawn broke. White road snake, steeply winding, went up the slope, and we knew that we were waiting for fire points and dragon's teeth on the pass. The vanguard of the 9th Armoured Division left at dawn, moving westward across the natural boundary of a low mountain range. Beyond the Stitcher Pass it ran into Yugoslavian fortifications. Our heavy guns started talking. 88-arm anti-aircraft guns and heavy anti-tank. Guns destroyed enemy fire points. In a matter of minutes they turned into smoking ruins. Everything looked somehow unreal. Far in the east the blood-red sun was rising, and in the valleys the morning fog was mixing with dense clouds of dust. Hues of red tracer bullets from our machine guns were streaming away from the pass we had captured down into the valley. Suddenly enemy airplanes appeared, Flying low over the mountains, they swirled over the road in the valley and attacked Kustendil as the bombs fell on the city. Its streets and roads in the vicinity were packed with columns of our troops. Thank God, the losses were not great. But unfortunately, the commander of the 2nd Battalion of our motorized infantry brigade, Sess Lebstand at Adolf Hitler, Obersturm Banfuhrer, 
monkey was severely wounded. SS Hauptsturmführer SS Baum took command of the battalion. Moving in columns, we came closer and closer to the border and finally reached it in the evening. The 9th Panzer Division had already broken through the border fortifications and was advancing deep into Yugoslavia. The lead tank unit was advancing on Skopje, firing on the move. We descended from the pass past destroyed border and road barriers and skillfully placed small concrete firing points. We came across numerous prisoners, among them many Germans from Barshka and Banat, who greeted us with loud cheers and shook hands with us. The corpses of dead horses, already bloated under the southern sun, lay in the trench. Live horses galloped across the fields or stood idly at the edge of the road. The rugged terrain had been replaced by somewhat different terrain. There were fewer mountains. High snow-capped peaks were left behind. We came across our first hit tanks and fresh graves near Kumanovo, which testified to the fierce battle for the town. Darkness descended quickly. Over the marching column, the darkness of the southern night rapidly thickened. Soon we had to reach the road fork south of Skopje. From Vels and onward, we were to assume the role of a shock vanguard in the advance southward through Prilep and Monastir. We reached the last outposts of the 9th Armoured Division shortly after midnight and prepared to enter no man's land. Before the advance guard platoon commanded by SS Untersturmfuhrer Warzinek took the vanguard, I once again briefed its soldiers and commanders, reported the situation for us and wished my battle comrades all the best. I admonished the platoon leaving into the darkness with the words. Guys, the night belongs to a good soldier. The motorcycles moved on, slowly at first, then faster and faster. It was reminiscent of the Dutch campaign. I soon discovered that Varvizinek had personally taken command and was rushing south without further ado but here were not the smooth asphalt roads of Holland and France. Our advance was connected with crossing narrow mountain roads and gorges. The road to Prilep climbed steeply upward. In a short time, the first bullets whistled over our heads. Individual enemy soldiers had encamped somewhere in the mountains and were trying to stop our advance. I followed the forward squad. A short command was enough to keep moving. Forward and only forward, our goal to seize the territory to the south and take advantage of the enemy's confusion. At the foot of a small hill behind the village we came under fire again. Armoured vehicles supported the attacking motorcycle gunners and hit the enemy with tracer shells. The motorcyclists combed the village. Our battalion's first engagement left over a hundred Yugoslavs, completely confused. Enemy officers cursed their outposts in the mountains, they listened incredulously to our interpreter's explanation that the fire from their outposts was not a hindrance to us, and we were just continuing to move south. Half an hour later it was all over. The motorcycle gunmen were rushing forward. There was no holding them back. We kept moving forward. In a frantic race along the mountain road and over bridges over chasms, we took the enemy battery on the march by surprise. In a few minutes the excitement subsided. With a clang and a rumble, the captured guns tumbled down into the abyss. At dawn, we arrived at Prilep and contacted the vanguard of the 73rd Infantry Division. The battalion was commanded by Major Stifeter, with whom I had studied at the refresher course in Muchlausen. Stifeter, moving from the east, reached Prilep without heavy losses. It looked like it was going to be a hot day. We allowed ourselves a short and much-needed rest. We were well on our way to the strategically important city of Manistia. Just before dawn, a light rain began. It mixed with the dust and turned it into a grey, sticky mud. We looked anxiously into the fleeing shadows of the night. The road now led to a plain with only one high mountain on the right. From the turn we saw the Carne River, where we noticed a solid bridge with steel arches. It had not been blown up yet. Several enemy trucks and horse-drawn wagons were approaching the bridge. I saw only the bridge. Nothing else interested me. It had to fall into our hands unharmed. Two armoured cars separated from the marching column and opened fire with their twenty MIM automatic cannons. On the far approaches to the bridge, our forward vehicles rushed toward the bridge as if they were being chased by the devil himself. The horse-drawn Yugoslav wagons and trucks 
trying to get away from us, collided in an effort to outrun each other and created congestion. They were only one hundred meters away from us. Stray bullets whistled past us. I could already see the unharmed bridge in my hands. But then, echoing through the entire river valley, came a deafening explosion. The bridge blew up right before my eyes and collapsed into the water. The enemy's horses, soldiers and vehicles were thrown into the air, along with the bridge and swallowed by the turbulent waters of the Sione. A Yugoslav machine gun rang out. At the terrified, then furious, and finally coldly assessing the situation, I approached the remains of the blown bridge. Harp Sturmfuhrer Kryas, commander of the second company of the 1st SS Reconnaissance Detachment, was standing next to me. The situation was quickly assessed, and a decision was made. The enemy could not be given time to respite. He had to be pursued. We were in luck. A metal structure protruded above the water and could be used as the base of a temporary bridge. Grenadiers on the ruins quickly prepared temporary positions. The sapper units arrived and directed the new crossing as if they were doing it as a drill. Motorcyclists crossed the river and reconnoitred the road to Monastir. The bridge grew before our eyes and soon the first heavy armoured vehicles crossed the river. The offensive continued. The second company again came forward. The railroad to Monastir ran to the left of the road on which we were advancing. Behind its embankment enemy gunners were crawling, trying in vain to delay our rapid advance. The armoured cars just gave a few machine gun bursts at the enemy lying behind and on the embankment. Everyone else was looking straight ahead. We wanted to take Monastir from the get-go. Nothing else mattered. The railroad embankment came closer and closer to the highway, crossing it a few hundred metres ahead of us. The advance party stopped, and the grenadiers jumped into the ditch on either side of the road. The house came into view, which was the focus of resistance. A 50 anti-tank gun took up position under enemy fire and fired a couple of rounds at the walls. The house rumbled to pieces. Only then I noticed that the enemy on the embankment became more active, daring because of the halt of our vanguard. From behind the embankment a machine gun rang out, showering us with a hail of bullets and leaving us no choice but to accept the challenge. The matter was quickly settled thanks to fire from armoured vehicles. The surviving Yugoslav soldiers fled into the swampy lowland behind the railroad embankment. I was about to jump into Sessanta Shaf Yuri Weil's motorcycle when renewed fire from several Yugoslavs pinned us to the ground again. My clipboard was riddled with bullets. Its scraps lay on the edge of the ditch. Enemy bullets clattered across the grass, whipping the damp earth around us. A gurgling sound made me look at Weil. He was squirming at the bottom of the ditch, his lower jaw shattered and hanging. We couldn't afford to get stuck here. The enemy could not be allowed to pin us down on the approaches to Monastir and knock us out of these high hills. I shouted to the forward units. The motorcyclists, like acrobats, jumped into their motorcycles and rushed forward. The forward units pulled the rest of the battalion behind them like a magnet. We raced along the rain-soaked, slippery road. It had been raining all day, and the sun was beginning to break through the torn clouds. The resistance of the Yugoslavs was mounting. The tracer bullets of their machine guns whistled viciously, piercing through the haystacks that served as a kind of shelter, turning them into giant torches. Manastir was directly in front of us. We could already see the city spread out among the mountains. On the slope on my right hand I saw an enemy battery just taking up position. Let's go. No time to put out the fires. We had to enter the town. We wanted to grab the defenders by the throat. We were mesmerized by the speed. With our machine guns, we fired at the enemy on both sides of the road. A half-built roadblock appeared right in front of us. Fire. The air was torn through the air by cues from armored vehicles, and hand grenades flew into the barricade. In total confusion, the day's defenders rushed for cover. Contrary to the enemy's expectations, we did not advance in a broad front. Instead, we acted in an unconventional manner like a dagger stroke. The battalion entered the city in a column. The only thing we didn't have with us was the artillery. It took up positions and fired over our heads. I saw no churches, minarets or other buildings. Only machine gun nests, 
defences in the houses and the determination of the enemy. The battalion was getting farther and farther into the city. I had lost my maps, but I knew where the barracks were. We wanted to get to them because that was where we would find the command post that controlled the enemy's actions. The enemy soldiers stationed in the square scattered as soon as our motorcycles came roaring out of the corner. The enemy fired at us from all windows, from rooftops and from gardens. The armoured cars proved their reliability. Their weapons reached every suspicious-looking corner and forced the enemy gunners to seek cover. Under cover of the fire from the armoured vehicles, two heavy 150M guns took position. From 200 metres they opened fire on the barracks. The result was impressive. Within 20 minutes, Monastir had lost almost all of its defenders, except at the pockets of resistance at the railroad station. Here a sapper unit fought, a battle with which was completed within an hour. Our offensive confirmed what we had learned in our years of study. A machine is a weapon. For several hours, the prisoners were brought in and disarmed, unconcerned about everything. We captured an entire artillery battalion without firing a shot, but the battle had to go on. We had no time to rest. The Yugoslav forces were positioned on Lake Arid and occupied the Javat Pass 20 kilometers west of Monastir, on the road leading to Lake Presna and onto Lake Orid. We knew that a significant British force that had landed in Greece was approaching from the south and moving towards the town of Florina. I was hard pressed to make a decision on our next action. We were alone in Monastir and could not count on support for the next 24 hours. I had to move out in two directions and also hold Monastir with captured prisoners, artillery and railroad men. Kreas's reinforced company was assigned to cross the Javat Pass and try to make contact with the Italians who were in Albania west of Lake Orid. Schroeder's company was ordered to reconnoitre the British positions south of Monastir and not to lose sight of the enemy. If possible, the British were to be prevented from leaving the Clyde Pass. Both company commanders looked at me in amazement when they received these orders. Hugo Crea shook his head incredulously. The situation for Schroeder was not so bad at all. He had plenty of room for manoeuvre, and with the roads in good condition, he had every opportunity for reconnaissance. The companies moved on. My motorcyclists, tank fighters, sappers and grenadiers passed me with joyous laughter. They were going into the darkness, into the unknown. The personnel of the headquarters prepared for defence and maintained radio contact. We maintained constant contact with the companies and received messages from the armoured vehicles. We were constantly aware of their location. Within minutes, Kraus attacked a battery located in the area of the gardens west of Monaster A, which surrendered. I was still awaiting orders to open fire. By midnight, Kraus had passed through several villages and was at the foot of the Jowat Pass. Reconnaissance reported that the pass was occupied and a well-equipped defensive position was arranged along the crest of the mountain ridge. The enemy reconnaissance teams were captured. The attack on the pass was to begin at dawn. Schroeder also acted successfully and soon reported already from Greek territory, from Florina and Vivi. Between these two localities, a curious incident happened to the company. As the old saying goes, all cats are grey at night. The next morning, Schroeder gave the following report. I dispatched several reconnaissance parties from the crossroads and slowly followed the first one making a reconnaissance in the direction of Florina. Shortly thereafter, two armoured reconnaissance vehicles emerged from the darkness, heading in our direction, and we continued to move forward. I thought they were ours. We realised our mistake only when they were two metres behind us. Two British armoured cars stopped in front of us, then slowly moved on. They didn't realise who was in front of them. Apparently they mistook us for Serbs. After calming down, I moved the company a few hundred metres forward and waited for the English armoured cars to return. Half an hour later, they fell victim to our ambush on the road. We were able to learn the enemy's intentions. Australian troops occupied the high ground and blocked the valley with extended minefields. Troder kept the British in sight and continued his battlefield reconnaissance. Our heavy guns and mortars had evidently deceived the enemy as to the true strength of our forces.
and the British kept a low profile from behind their barriers. Krayas's attack on the Dejivat Pass began early in the morning. The road here rose steeply uphill, so the surprise attack was out of the question. Steep turns followed one after another. Almost sheer chasms, gorges, overhanging cliffs and bare, treeless spaces completed the picture. The pass was 1179 metres high. It bordered on madness to risk attacking it with only one reinforced company. But our trump card was surprise. No one expected such a rapid advance and no one could think that one company alone could risk attacking them. I went forward to Kreas's company before dawn. I was very anxious and wanted to take part in the attack myself. We passed the World War I Memorial just north of Monastir, there on the heights, countless German soldiers rested in foreign soil. Suddenly I saw twenty mim tracer shells from automatic cannons soaring up into the mountains like pearl necklaces. Krayas's attacking company could only be supported by armoured vehicles. The motorcyclists turned into mountain huntsmen. All night they climbed to the pass on both sides of the road and found themselves right in front of the enemy positions on the ridge. Several Yugoslav positions were bypassed and attacked from the rear. Rather energetically, the company commander led his soldiers in the attack, and they quickly overran the Serbian positions on the ridge. The psychological effect of the heavy guns made a surprisingly significant contribution to the victory. The bursting of large caliber shells created an infernal noise. I followed an armored vehicle and took part in the last battle for the pass. T. Coach's group had eliminated the last pockets of resistance here. I found Hugo Krayas behind a small chapel and congratulated him on his success. Several hundred prisoners lay or stood before us. An entire battalion had surrendered. The result was simply unfathomable. Our battalion in the place of the enemy could withstand the attacks of more than one regiment, and here one company was attacked. The commander of the enemy battalion explained to us what happened, he said. When my soldiers heard yesterday that the German troops had already reached Manastia and would appear in front of our positions by nightfall, their will to resist was greatly weakened. The very fact that we would have to fight German soldiers unnerved my battalion. Your A bombardments completed the job. From the crest of the pass, we looked down at the matte sheen of Blue Lake Presner to the southwest. And from Mount Pelister, we could also see the bright lights of Florina. The town was ours even before the enemy knew that his battalion surrounded on the Javat Pass had surrendered. We had no spare motorcycles on hand but several armoured vehicles were ready to descend into the valley and take the enemy by surprise. As we made our way down slowly by feel, following the twists and turns of the Serpentine Road, Krayas's company assembled and waited for their vehicles. We reached the valley without encountering the enemy and rushed toward the town of Aurid. I was in the armoured car Bugelzek. This S.E. Oso Ombachauffeur is the commander of my best reconnaissance group and perfectly oriented in the emerging situation. The fleeing Serbs rushed away from the road and sought shelter in the thickets. Others dropped their weapons and moved toward the pass. In this case we could not stop. We had to enter the town and take advantage of the confusion. Under the machine gun bursts, the road was becoming clear. The surprise factor worked 100%. In just a few minutes we were already firing red rockets into the sky. Krayas's company soon broke into the town and sent reconnaissance teams into the mountains west of Lake Orid to establish contact with the Italians. Within a few hours this was accomplished. The first task of the reconnaissance battalion was accomplished quickly, successfully and without unnecessary losses. I was proud of my soldiers and knew that I could rely on them for everything. I reported my battalion's latest success to the commander of the Lebstandart in Monastir and went with him to Schruder Company, where we met with the commander of the 1st Battalion of the Liebstander to Adolf Hitler, Sess Sturm Banfuhrer Witt. His battalion was ordered to take key British positions defending the Kledi Pass, thus allowing the breakthrough of the Liebstande and the 9th Panzer Division. The New Zealanders and Australians properly entrenched themselves on the mountain slope of the Kidi Pass. The enemy had time to create here an impressive system of defence. Their artillery observers had a wide view of the plain on which our troops were to appear. Monastir was a sort of gateway blocking the way from the Kidi Pass, 
and the pass was the gateway from Yugoslavia to Greece. On the side of the enemy were all the advantages. Numerous minefields on the pass excluded the attack of armoured vehicles. To take the heights our infantry had to fight hard. A sunny summer day, as it often happens in the mountains, was replaced by a rainy evening and then the icy cold of night. Snow covered the slopes. The soldiers of the 1st Battalion of the Lebstander T.A. Dolph, Hitler faced a vastly superior enemy for He thoroughly entrenched himself in anticipation of our attack. It happened at dawn on August 12. The whistle of heavy shells broke the silence. Heavy anti-aircraft guns began to destroy the detected pockets of resistance. Self-propelled guns rolled forward. I stood at the optical tube, watching the attack of the 1st Company of the Motorized Brigade of the SS Lepstande Adolf Hitler under the command of Cesso Bestürmfeuer Gerd Place. Shots were still hailing from the mountain. The entire summit was in smoke, and the air smelled of earth and gunpowder. Suddenly the artillery fire ceased. The infantry rushed into the attack, making their way up the mountain. Heavy self-propelled guns from the valley were climbing up the slopes. We watched in amazement as the self-propelled guns moved forward. They were higher and higher, and then engaged in battle. No one had thought they could be used here. But now they were up there giving invaluable support to the infantry. Completely shaken by the unexpected gunfire from the Germans, the British who had surrendered came down from the pass. They were tall, tough guys and serious contenders. Our infantry advanced deeper and deeper into the British defence system. To clear the way for armoured vehicles, our sappers engaged in minefields. But the most difficult job knocking out the British from their positions had to perform still infantry. We saw how stood, shocked, over the remains of his dead brother Franzel S. S. Sturm Banfier Witt, Franzel Witt had tried to cross a minefield and was torn apart by exploding mines. His company was already fighting right under the pass. The self-propelled guns could no longer support our infantry. We could not hear the explosions of hand grenades, but only see clouds of smoke from them. The enemy's firing points were captured by our infantry in hand-to-hand -hand combat, and the pass was taken by storm. The brave men of Plessy's company prevailed over the enemy. More than 100 prisoners were taken, 20 machine guns and other military equipment were captured. Gerd Plessis himself was wounded, but remained with his grenadiers until the end of the battle. The gates to Greece were opened. However, the fighting continued. The 1st Battalion of our motorized infantry brigade SS Lebstander Adolf Hitler attacked the retreating enemy at a furious pace. Enemy tanks were destroyed by anti-tank and self-propelled guns. The enemy planes tried to interfere with our offensive, but their bombs did not achieve the desired effect of the British because of the difficulty of bombing in the mountains. Sharp Sturmfuhr SS Fend, commander of a battery of 88 ATM guns, was taken prisoner and spent the night in a British column. At dawn our infantry freed him, and at the same time took a significant number of New Zealanders prisoner. Early in the morning the southern descent from the pass was taken. A large force of British and Greeks tried to regain the lost and push the Germans back over the pass. The British had a large number of tanks at their disposal and were seriously threatening our vanguard. The 1st Battalion of the SS Motorized Infantry Brigade Lebstandarty Adolf, Hitler had already entered the open countryside and our self-propelled guns were still on the mountain road, which created a dangerous situation. The first enemy tanks were already halfway from the lead company, when suddenly SS Obersturm Führ Norman appeared with his two 88mm guns, opened fire and put an end to the nightmare. One by one the British tanks flew into the air or, fuming, froze. The tank attack choked in fire, death and wreckage. As the 9th Armoured Division moved south, my reconnaissance battalion rushed toward Lake Astoria. The shadows of night were already surrounding us when we saw the dark mountains and the Klesura Pass we wanted. Our objective was the town of Korka and the headquarters of the II Greek Corps. But before that we had before us the Klesura Pass, which in itself was a serious obstacle to equipment, let alone enemy opposition. As we climbed to an altitude of nearly 1400 meters, the surrounding mountains seemed to press down on us. 
advancement was rapid. The two ridges stretching out in front of us were overcome in the next half hour. In front of us lay a wide mountain massif, along it ran, winding the road going upwards by a succession of narrow serpentine curves. There was no way back. It was impossible to turn back. On the left, the mountain steepened into a gorge, while on the right, sheer cliffs soared upward. The small mountain villages seemed extinct and abandoned. In the last village, its inhabitants looked at us with horror. Their faces expressed question and expectation. An eerie tension gripped us. The smell of exhaust fumes filled the clear mountain air. The next ridge appeared directly in front of us in several rows. The road veered slightly to the right and then passed over a bridge over a narrow but deep gorge. We manoeuvred cautiously towards the bend in the road. At any moment we expected a hail of bullets or rocks raining down on us from above. We felt as if we were walking on hot coals. The vanguard halted. The soldiers hid behind cover and prepared to open fire. What was going on? Still no one opened fire. Gripped by nervous tension, I ran forward. Suddenly a chasm opened up in front of us on the road. The bridge over the gorge had been blown up. The massive stone span of the bridge lay piled on the bottom of the gorge and formed a low saddle. We were surprised to find the obstacle unguarded and no sign of any positions. We cautiously crept forward to the collapsed saddle. The gorge was perhaps fifteen metres wide and could easily be crossed by soldiers on foot. However, it was impossible for motorcycles. The lead platoon was ordered to cover the far end of the bridge and ensure that the temporary bridge was safely erected. As soon as the grenadiers reached the wreckage of the bridge, machine gun bursts whistled around us. We could distinguish the enemy's position on our right, on top of the mountain. Flashes of fire from machine gun barrels indicated their location. Mines whistled through the air and exploded in the gorge behind us. It was the enemy mortars trying to drive us away from the obstacle. My battalion was in a very unpleasant position. It could neither move forward nor backward. There was no alternative. We were on the only road going through the mountains to the rear of the I.I. Greek Corps. Overcoming such a mountain range was really only a matter for mountain infantry units, not a reconnaissance battalion of a motorized brigade. But these reflections were absorbed by current events. There were no mountain troops on hand, so we had to do their job. And we did. Both of our motorcycle companies attacked enemy positions at dawn, while I continued along the road with drivers, headquarters, and a company of armoured vehicles, diverting the enemy's attention from the direction of the main attack. We would not need heavy weapons and artillery until later. Meanwhile, darkness was falling on the gorge. The enemy from time to time opened a disturbing fire on the obstacle. Our sappers drilled holes for explosive charges in order to level the approaches to the former bridge. An explosion, and in a matter of seconds masses of earth and stones collapsed into the gorge on top of the wreckage of the bridge. Now my mobile reconnaissance battalion turned into a construction battalion. Sturdy grenadiers hauled boulders and dumped them down onto the wreckage of the bridge, a living conveyor belt passing stone after stone. Shortly thereafter, the first anti-tank gun passed over the temporary bridge as soon as the new bridge was completed. Two motorcycle companies began the climb up the mountain range. The motorcyclists became mountain gamekeepers. The Grenadiers had to climb up 800 metres before attacking pockets of enemy resistance. Both companies marched to the assault. Each of them, separated from the other by a chasm, had to act independently. Although they followed separate routes, they had a common goal. The now the enemy was before us. The fatigue of the soldiers was blown away like a wind. Nerves were tense, all instincts for action heightened. Our soldiers used the traditional tactics used in difficult terrain, supported each other, found when climbing ledges for support. Kreas's company also moved away from the chasm to the right and climbed the mountain. It had the longest way to go. I took charge of the detachment which was to advance along the road. It consisted of thirty men. At our disposal were several armoured vehicles, anti-tank guns and a section of 88mm anti-aircraft guns. The road serpentine went higher and higher, and we had no communication with other companies at all. 
it was quiet. Nothing broke the silence of the night, not a single shot was heard. The moon disappeared behind the mountains and the night grew darker and darker. Judging from the map, we had reached a great bend in the road, which was to go around the last rock to the rear of the enemy. His positions were to be high above us. Our design was to outflank his flank and cut off the means of retreat. The road turned behind the mountain and stretched another 400 metres in a northerly direction before turning west again to a group of peasant houses. Near these houses was the pass where the road crossed the crest of the ridge and then descended to Lake Castoria. I did not dare to go any farther forward. I had a feeling that something was wrong. I should have waited for dawn. It was windy and cold on the pass. We were pressed tightly against the rock. Nauman's platoon pulled the 88B empty aircraft gun into position so that it could cover the peasant houses and the crest of the ridge with its fire. Gradually it became unbearably cold. Since we had neither overcoats nor blankets, we suffered greatly shivering from the cold. Sleep was out of the question. If we could at least have a smoke, a radio communication vehicle was slowly creeping up. Under its cover, I smoked and studied the map again. The longer I looked at it, the more the shivers came over me. At first I thought my teeth were chattering because of the terrible cold, but then I realized I was really scared. The more time passed, the more tense I became. I couldn't stay in the car any longer. The radio transmitter with its endless beep, beep, beep was getting on my nerves. Outside I tried not to talk to anyone. I was afraid someone would hear my teeth chattering and realize I was scared. We all huddled silently behind the rock, peering into the darkness. Were my comrades afraid too? I didn't know. Motorized rifleman John from the first company of the SS Reconnaissance Unit arrived with a report. However, he did not look frightened. He briefly and clearly reported the situation to me, and then he was given a drink of alcohol from the medic's flask. It got brighter. Soon we could distinguish the outline of the village. The attack of our three battle groups was to be launched by the fire of 88M guns. I crouched behind the shield of the gun and tried to see something in the darkness through binoculars. The closer we got to opening fire, the more confident I became in the success of the attack. It simply had to be successful. I was counting on the fact that the enemy had learned the basics of military science at the military academy and anticipated what measures we could take in this case. From everything the Greek commander had been taught, he would expect me to advance my motorized unit along the road. That is why I will attack him across the two ridges, and on the road I will undertake only a diversionary attack. As the night shadows melted, the outlines of houses could be distinguished. Pressing myself to the ground, I gave Norman the order to open fire. In a matter of seconds, we found ourselves as if in a boiling witch's cauldron. The 88mm anti-aircraft guns sent shell after shell over the ridge to our right. Mortars and infantry guns also showered the defenders with mines and heavy shells. High above us, motorcyclists were storming the enemy's defensive positions. I could not see the two motorcycle companies attacking, but I could hear the fierce machine gun fire and the explosions of their grenades. The battery commander of the heavy 150 m howitzer battery informed me that he could no longer provide fire support to the attacking companies without jeopardizing the personnel of the units. The guns took up positions along the mountain road, one by one, but because the road was too narrow, they could not anchor their culters in the ground. The commander refused to accept responsibility. This kind of nonsense was the last straw in the cup of my patience. In anger, I ordered him to open fire. We had to do it. Heavy shells rumbled over the first ridge and exploded on the enemy positions on each side of the small mountain village. Enemy machine gun fire streaked in hail over the road and the rocks above us, causing rockfall down the slope. Rocks rumbled all around us. There was nothing to be done but to move forward. We rushed swiftly, leaping like frogs, to the first bend in the road and took cover, traversing a few more meters ahead, behind a rock. At the next bend, we would be directly under the enemy position 100 meters above. After this sprint, I collapsed in exhaustion, behind a block of rock, and was catching air with my mouth. Our advance was hampered by having to run from one pile of rocks to another, 
using them as cover to avoid being targeted by enemy snipers. We could hear above us the shouts and furious sounds of battle. Units of the 2nd Company, 1st SS Reconnaissance Battalion, broke through to the enemy positions on the first ridge. We rushed forward. At the last big bend in the Serpentine Road, we came across several soldiers who had been separated by a cleft from the rest of the company during the attack. Among them was Cess Unter Sturmfuhr Warwazinek, who briefed me on the operation on the crest of the ridge. From information from the prisoners we learned that we were opposed by a reinforced infantry regiment on the left flank of the Greek defences. It had the task of holding the Klisura Pass, ensuring the withdrawal from the Albanian front of the III Greek Corps, which was withdrawn to avoid encirclement by German motorised units and continue the battle for Greece in cooperation with British forces. The Greek plan could not be allowed to go ahead. The withdrawal was not only to be prevented but was to fail utterly. We were to complete the crossing over the mountains and block the valley beyond Castoria. We continued to advance along the road. Suddenly the ground in front of us surged upward. I could not believe my eyes. A huge crater had formed where the road had just been. The road dropped into the abyss. Sweat left streaks of light on our faces. We were horrified. After all, in the next few seconds we too could have gone up in flames. After another 100 metres the ground shook again, and when the dust settled there was another giant crater in the road. We hid behind the rocks, not daring to move. I was choked with nausea. I shouted to Emil Wozinek to attack, but good old Emil looked at me as if he doubted that I was normal. Machine gun fire slashed across the rocks in front of us. Our lead unit consisted of only ten soldiers. Damn it! Surely we couldn't stay here while craters from explosions formed in the road and machine gun fire pinned us against the rocks. However, I, like everyone else, scrambled for cover and feared for my life. Now could I have ordered Vavizinek to go first? As I continued to worry, I felt the smooth roundness of the egg-shaped grenade in my hand. I called out to the group. Everyone looked at me stunned as I displayed the grenade, pulled the pin, and it rolled toward the last grenadier. I had never seen such a friendly rush forward. As if bitten by a tarantula, we tore across the rocks and plunged into the funnel that had just formed. The stupor was broken. The grenade had done its work. We grinned and rushed forward to a new shelter. On top of the ridge crest, our attacking companies were getting farther and farther into the Greek defences. Our 88 meme guns were in clouds of dust and smoke from the bursting shells of the Greeks' mountain artillery, but Norman's anti-aircraft guns kept firing. The shells of the anti-aircraft 88 MAM guns pierced the road for us, burying pockets of Greek resistance under piles of rubble. We were just under the crest of the ridge. Sweat covered my eyes. I watched the battle through a veil of dust and dirt. We were rushing like mad up the ridge. The Greeks were getting out of their positions, raising their hands in the air, ending their resistance. Their escape route was already covered by the fire of the 2nd Company of the 1st SS Reconnaissance Battalion, whose machine guns from the dominant height directly fired at the enemy positions. My soldiers broke the resistance of the Greeks, supported by a battery of mountain guns with hand grenades. We made the crossing over the mountains at the limit of our strength. My grenadiers accomplished what others thought impossible, and what even today is considered mad. The Klisura Pass is ours. But there was no time for respite. Only a swift pursuit of the enemy would bring us complete victory. Our sappers blasted rock debris into craters in the road. Artillery changed position and fired on the retreating enemy. Old columns were withdrawing to the west and further south. The resistance of the Greeks, who as a rule, bravely held their positions to their last breath, was broken. We captured over a thousand men, including the regimental and three battalion commanders. Only then the full strategic importance of the position we had captured became clear to us. From the pass we could see directly the escape routes of the Greek troops from Albania, to which the fire of all our weapons was now directed. I wanted to move on after the fleeing enemy. But again on the road sloping steeply downward there were deafening explosions. Precious time was lost in filling in the giant funnels from the high explosives. The second company of the 1st S Reconnaissance Battalion drove down the road to begin with and entered a small village. 
All of its inhabitants had left their homes and were gone. I wanted to regroup my battalion there and then move along the main retreat route of the Greek. I waited for the first company of the 1st SS Reconnaissance Battalion. Soon the young soldiers appeared. From their faces I understood everything. They were carrying the remains of their company commander on a blood-soaked tent. Rudolf Schroeder lay in front of me. His chest was torn to pieces. He had achieved outstanding military successes, but had been killed while breaking through an enemy defense system while commanding the lead assault team. We descended from the mountains towards evening and scouted the approaches to Castoria, a town on the shores of the lake of the same name at 630 meters above sea level. I wanted to reconnoiter and followed the recon group. Before a small bridge, we slowed down. Further on, we could see the altitude of 800, which dominated the approaches to Castoria. No movement was visible on the bridge. It had not yet been blown up. Suddenly, machine gun fire was opened on us. The war correspondent Franz Roth, who was walking with the reconnaissance team, suddenly cried out in pain. The bullet had literally split his skull. With a bloody head, but alive, the correspondent the second company of the 1st S Reconnaissance Battalion reached the bridge at nightfall, creating a small bridgehead. The company reconnoitred north of Lake Castoria and met stubborn enemy resistance. The attack on Hill 800 southwest of Castoria began at dawn. Again our shells rumbled over us and shattered blocks of stone, but the Greek artillery was more powerful here. The bridge collapsed from a direct hit. We lay at the bottom of the trench, pressed into the muddy ground. The intensity of the artillery fire told me that a surprise assault would not be successful. A well-thought-out attack was required. About mid-afternoon the attack was renewed. Supported by heavy artillery and the 3rd Battalion of the Motorized Infantry Brigade of the SS Lepstandard Adolf Hitler, the battalion advanced to cover the Greek positions on the left and had until evening to reach the main Greek withdrawal route. In order to suppress the strong Greek artillery and help destroy the enemy positions at the height of 800, U87 Stuka dive bombers were called in to support my battalion. The operation was conducted with unrivaled precision. The Stukas would strike enemy positions like birds of prey, making wide circles around the mountain and then dive with a howl deep down. On the heights and mountain massif there were flashes from the dropped bombs, came the rumble. Mushroom-shaped columns of dust and rock rose into the sky, blowing each other and drifting in a dark haze over the lake. A dense shroud covered the mountain, showing the devastating effect of our bombs and artillery shells. A veritable inferno unfolded there. When the first bombs fell, the motorcyclists jumped out of their trenches and ran across the open field with difficulty in catching their breath. The excellent firing of the 88 Meem defence guns finished off the Stukas and heavy artillery. It would be a long time before the Greeks recovered from the U-87 attack. By then, it would be too late. The soldiers of the 2nd Company of the 1st SS Reconnaissance Battalion climbed the mountain and entrenched themselves among the rock. The rest of the battalion rushed to Castoria via a hastily repaired bridge. The unsuspecting Greek companies and batteries withdrawing from the mountains were so stunned that they did not fire a shot and voluntarily surrendered. One of the Greek batteries, however, continued to fire and was shattered by us. The armoured vehicles of our battalion roared past the Greek columns toward the centre of Castoria. The chaos was complete. In the market square I was greeted by a local priest. I will never forget his fraternal embrace. Then I stank of garlic for hours. At dusk, my brave comrades took over the defence of the northern approaches to Castoria. Greek units were coming and going from Albania to Castoria after fighting with Italian troops. It rained constantly. Thunderclaps of a strong thunderstorm alternated with the rumble of shells and bombs. Our strength was running out. We fell asleep on the spot. The extent of our success did not become apparent until the next morning. In the last 24 hours, my reconnaissance battalion had taken 12,000 prisoners and captured 36 guns. For the manner in which my brave grenadiers had shown themselves, I was awarded the Knight's Cross. The fighting with the trapped Greek army continued. 
SS Brigade Lipstandart, overcoming considerable difficulties, took passing the town of Metzivon, the pass of Katara, through the mountains of Pindus and forced the surrender of the 16th Division of the Greeks. The surrender was signed on April 21 at Larissa. Toward the evening of April 24, when I was in Yanina, I was ordered to pursue the defeated British troops. My comrades in arms had just managed to get a good night's sleep for the first time since the beginning of the Balkan campaign. In the morning, they were roused from their dreamless sleep. The fuel tanks of our motorcycles and cars were filled to the brim from canisters taken from the Greek's garage. No one had bothered to collect the Greek machine guns stacked outside the Ali Pasha Mosque in the old Turkish fortress, as well as the myriad weapons left in the city. The Greek soldiers who had come here, over the mountain passes from Albania, left their weapons leaning against the walls of the houses, shaved off their dark beards, went to the nearest bakery, and came out with loaves of fresh bread, a bunch of leeks, and if they were lucky, a few fish strung on a rod. Then they would wander south again. We intercepted them. This interception once again illustrated to us the difference between the road of the victors and the road of the vanquished. These men, who had been fishermen, farmers, shepherds, traders, or professional military men, must have been respectable people before the defeat of Greece. Now they wandered chaotically through valleys and passes, returning home in disgrace. The war had ended for them in hopeless confusion. Even if we happened to see a lone colonel sitting upright in his saddle, it was decay. We, on the other hand, were advancing farther and farther. We were going to pin down the British sooner or later. The battalion didn't stop anywhere, but along the way we asked a few questions at each village or small town. Whoever managed to cut a piece of bread with grease smeared on it, on the way would cover it with his hand until he ate it, so as not to eat the rapidly adhering layer of dust and dirt at the same time. Only once at Amarakiko's Bay did I allow myself a brief stop. I found the local orange groves simply enchanting. The soldiers filled their helmets with the fragrant fruit. We wanted to taste it and make sure we were in the south. On a narrow mountain road stood the unfortunate pony of the Greek army, a white horse with blue shadows showing between its ribs, abandoned, unharnessed, on its last breath. It did not move. It stood like a monument of defeat. Our armoured cars and motorcycles passed by her. The horse, too, was a veteran of a lost war, an exhausted, pathetic creature. Further south we moved, crossing rushing mountain rivers, and saw unarmed soldiers enjoying the cool water. But we, covered in mud and sweat, could not enjoy a single drop. We saw thousands of people lying in the shade of olive trees. Instead, we had to keep an eye on the fuel level and the curves of the road. We had to avoid potholes and hold on tight to the steering wheel as our cars tossed over bumps. We remembered the miserable Polish roads, of course, but this road was a bloody cheese grape that seemed to want to shake the soul out of us. Night was replacing evening, and we still hadn't reached our objective. The straggling British soldiers and subversive teams scattered in front of us. Greek peasants told us that the British were deploying spike strips on the roads to delay our advance, and this proved to be true. Drivers swore as they had to change another flat tyre. We made a brief stop in a small town. The battalion was not to attract attention. The pursuit of the British continued into the dawn. We were rushing all the time southward, up through a low mountain range and down again into the valley. We crossed deep gorges. The ruins of classical Greece greeted us. Someone remembered Lord Byron, who was killed here in a battle with the Turks in 1824. But we had no time to think about history. The town of Mesolonian appeared right in front of us. Soon we would reach the Isthmus of Corinth, and then we could intercept the British. The vanguard cautiously moved its route towards the city and entered its narrow streets. The population of Greece greeted us. The last British troops had just left the city and were retreating along the coast along the eastward leading road heading towards the Isthmus of Corinth. The throw across the Peloponnese. We endured a 250-kilometer trek through mountainous country and stopped in front of the dark mountains that towered over the Peloponnese Peninsula. We had no radio contact with the regiment. We were alone. 
British reconnaissance planes were flying above us and making circles over the port of Petras on the other side of the bay. We could see ships in the harbour and we saw a British destroyer pulling away to take a course south. We were on the trail of the British bomber teams and were soon to reach the Isthmus of Corinth. But I was no longer interested in this kind of pursuit. The gaping craters in the road were reducing our speed. I thought that I would rather gain great experience in road building than intercept the English. The mountains on the other side of the Gulf of Corinth drew my attention more and more often. On the road along the coast of the Peloponnese, at the far end of the Gulf, British units were moving from Corinth to Patras to reach ships and evacuate. I must get there, but how to cross the bay? I was standing on the breakwater at Nafpaktos, a small, unassuming harbour with the towers of a medieval fortress, when a formation of U-87 Stuka dive bombers attacked the port of Patras. Clouds of smoke and explosions rose into the air from the cluster of ships. Suddenly I noticed the telephone. It was still plugged in. It was working, and Patras was answering it. Startled, I put the receiver back on the lever of the ancient machine. But I was enamoured with the idea of crossing the bay and confusing the British plans. I sent for an interpreter, demanded that I summon the Greek commandant at Patras and ask him to report on the situation. The commandant was impressed by the dive bomber attack and readily answered all questions. In a matter of minutes I received accurate information about the movement of British troops between the towns of Corinth and Patras. I ordered the commandant to send liaison officers to Napaktos. Soon I noticed a small motorboat heading for Nafpaktos. Here the devil himself came into play. Another squadron of Stukas roared over us and re-attacked the British ships in the harbour. The unpleasant result was that the commandant of the town thought it was me who had ordered another attack on Patras. To top it all off, on the way back the pilots attacked a motorboat on which a liaison officer was riding. The boat immediately turned 180 degrees and the angry Greek officer reported by telephone that no one would want to cross the bay under such conditions. Sweat dripped from my forehead onto the map. It was long out of date. Where were the British? On the left wing, following the capture of Thermopylae, our troops must either reach Athens or move further, to the Isthmus of Corinth. Consequently, the British had to either defend the Peloponnese or take control of the Greek ports. I envisioned German parachutists landing on the isthmus to block the narrow passage and canal near Corinth. Having had the British taken notice of our rapid advance, did their intelligence work well? Were destroyers and other vessels standing by to thwart our attempts to cross the bay? No one could give me an answer to these questions. My soldiers and officers looked at me expectantly. They saw me standing on the breakwater, estimating the distance again and again. More than 15 kilometres of water separated us from the British retreat route. By the next day at the latest, the Isthmus of Corinth would be the object of confrontation, and I wanted to be part of that battle. I wanted to cross. With Ormond of Truth had arrived, since all the responsibility falling on me, I would not act according to the traditional rules of war. I would cross the Gulf of Corinth with the forces I had at my disposal. Whether this was a bold or a reckless move would be known in the next few hours. My comrades responded enthusiastically, but objections of a practical nature soon arose. The artillery would not be able to support the landing. The distance was too great. The military engineers called my attention to the height of the waves and the condition of the wretched fishing boats. Objections were piling up, but I had already made up my mind. A surprise attack must be successful. In the harbour we discovered two wretched fishing boats. Their crews were brought to the site. The second company of the 1st SS Reconnaissance Battalion was to attempt a reconnaissance. The strong arms of the SS men lifted the heavy BMW motorcycles and placed them in the boats. The first boat took on board two motorcycles with sidecar and 15 men. On the next boat we loaded an anti-tank gun and several motorcycles, the combat task, to block the road and in case of emergency to go into the mountains. Then the motorboats left the harbour. I said goodbye to Hugo Kreas and to SS Sturmbanfura Gretzi. Those who stayed behind dubbed the motorcyclists a group of suicide bombers. 
someone jokingly said. Look out, there's a mine on the course. Everyone laughed. A young soldier shouted back, What mine are we talking about? A grenade is enough for this skiff. The boat was rocking hard. The waves pelted us with salty spray. The machine gunners took a position on the bow. The anti-tank gun was ready to fire. All the boats from our shore were directed to Nafactos. Soon the rest of the company was loaded onto the boats, and the first boats could hardly be seen any more. Two tiny dots were bouncing on the waves. I stood on the dock again and watched the dark dots on the water. A red flare would herald the failure of the mission and the presence of a large enemy force. That was exactly what I had agreed with my soldiers, in to get a tear in my eye. Soon I was no longer able to make out anything, but I couldn't take my eyes off the binoculars. By the time I had lost sight of the boats, my clothes were wet with sweat. We had been waiting on the shore for an hour. The tension had reached its limit. After an hour and a half, two dots appeared again. Were they our boats? They were getting closer and closer. Soon we could clearly distinguish their outlines, and we could even see movement. A circle of cigarette butts had already formed near me, and I was lighting another cigarette. However, I had already calmed down and began to believe in the success of our operation. Suddenly, a staff car stopped on the shore, covered in dust, and excited officers jumped out of it. I recognized my esteemed commander, Sepp Dietrich, and reported my decision and the progress of the operation so far. As I made my report, I noticed his earlier bloody shortness of breath and the look that swept over me from head to toe. Then a storm erupted over me. Are you out of your mind making such an idiotic decision? You should be court-martialed. How can you treat my soldiers like this? I dared not answer anything to this torrent of undoubtedly justified indignation. I stood at the old harbour wall, tucked up my tail, and wished only that it would all be over. Suddenly there was an awkward pause. Only my soldiers chuckled quietly, as if to say, hang in there, ignore his barking. He may be right, but get us across the bay now so we can do something else. In the meantime, the boats had gotten closer, and through binoculars it was possible to make out details. Both boats were full of soldiers. More men were coming back than I had sent out. I didn't dare say it out loud, but that was the way it was. Both boats were carrying back captured British soldiers. Sepp Dietrich looked at me, turned and went. Not another word was uttered. I had no more reason to delay. The laden motorboats sailed in the direction of the returning gunboats. Tensely I waited for a report from the other shore. What happened there? Ex Rotham Fuhrer reporte. After half an hour of movement on these shells before the masts appeared, a clump of mountainous coast of the Peloponnese Peninsula. Now came the final test. Everyone scrutinized the shore with binoculars. Up to it 800 meters, 700 meters, 600 meters, 500 meters. From there, of course, a machine gun must be Zastrovat. Some people in uniform between the houses and on the shore could be seen through binoculars and with the naked eye. We didn't think about anything else. We were lying in the boat holding rifles and machine guns at the ready, and we were ready for the landing. As soon as we reached land, we jumped overboard and raced toward the houses. And just at the moment when we were running, a brown armoured car came down the road from behind a bend, about fifty metres away from us, turned its turret and pointed its gun barrels at the shore. We, who had just landed, were at first paralysed with surprise, but then we pulled ourselves together and waved to the armoured car in a friendly manner. Standing on the shore in short-sleeved shirts and no hats, we looked like bandits. The Tommy car roared, turned back its turret and sped away. What happened? Did these guys not recognise us as Germans? We stood at the first houses, squinting our eyes and tensing up. Looking back at the other side of Greece, we saw nothing but water and in the distance beyond, steep bleak mountains. We had to act. We knew that our comrades on the other side of the bay were waiting. It was just over 100 metres from the shore to the foot of the mountains, where the railroad and automobile country roads passed. We rushed up the road and covered our eastern flank, the side from which the British appeared. Barely had we reached the road when we heard the engine noise again. 
The platoon commander told us to take cover. By that time, the locals, vine growers, and fishermen had already come out of their houses. When they saw the foreign soldiers, who had been hiding among the boulders and in the bushes, they rushed to the ground in fear. But our hearts were also beating frantically with excitement. From around the bend appeared an English messenger on a motorcycle, followed by a truck. The British moved along the road, not worrying about anything, because the armoured truck had already done a reconnaissance. We let the British get so close that we could read the license plates until a shield with a feather, knight's helmet with a cross. The emblem of the 4th Hussar Regiment was above us. Then we quickly jumped up and shouted, Hands up! The brakes squealed. The Englishman looked up and jumped off the truck. The foot of a messenger on a motorcycle fumbled for the ground. One Tommy shouted something, his machine gun flying into the bushes. Hands up! Hands up! All the British soldiers dropped their weapons and raised their hands. Suddenly one of ours ran out from behind a bend and shout, Another truck is coming. In a matter of seconds an SS man jumped into the first truck and drove it off the road. The prisoners were quickly taken behind the houses. A second truck appeared, again with a messenger on a motorcycle in front. The surprise and amazement were repeated. One of the Tommies only managed to exclaim, Germans? Indeed, the Germans were already here. In a few minutes we had captured over 40 men, including three officers. They told us they were on their way to the port of Patras. It never occurred to any of the British that we had already crossed the bay. Their part was still fighting near Corinth. Give me the watercraft, all the motorboats and boats in the neighbourhood we had collected. The whole battalion was to cross during the next night. My faithful driver Eric Pittersilly had the last bottle of sparkling wine hanging, submerged in the harbour water. I took it under my arm and went to see Sepp Derrytrich, who was conversing with the English officers. I invited the Englishman to have a glass with us. We sat down in the shade of the thick foliage of a tree. Before I could utter a word, the English officer raised his glass and drank to the health of his sister, who was evidently having a birthday. I'm sure we didn't look like learned men during this drinking session. I said my goodbyes and jumped into one of the damn boats we had obtained. After half an hour of churning through the waves, I was exhausted as a dog. I didn't believe that the shell we were in would reach the other shore, but it got us there. Completely exhausted, I saluted Krayas's company. According to orders, the company, having received the vehicles, was to reconnoiter as far as Corinth. S.S. Sturm Banfura Grexi contacted the commandant of the city of Petras and ordered from him large motorboats which were to deliver our heavy equipment from Nafpaktos. At the same time, the last British left the area of Patras and withdrew to the south. In the afternoon, air reconnaissance reported on the enemy parts, advancing from Corinth to Patras. Things were taking an interesting turn. The unloading was completed lightning fast, and the ships could return to the far shore as quickly as possible. As for heavy armament, we had several anti-tank guns and a light armoured car at our disposal. We were preparing a warm welcome for the English. But the English regiment reported did not arrive. Evidently it had changed its direction of travel toward the southern coast of the Peloponnese. Through the intelligence service we learned of the operations of our parachutists near Corinth, and that the 2nd Parachute Regiment was stationed there. Contact with the parachutists was to be established immediately. The 2nd Company of the 1st SA Reconnaissance Battalion was ordered to clear the southern coast of the Gulf of Corinth from the enemy and move out to join the parachutists. The 1st Company, 1st SA's Reconnaissance Battalion occupied Patras and reconnoitred in a southerly direction. The company travelled in captured and confiscated cars and motorcycles. An elegant limousine dragged an anti-tank gun behind it and mortars peered out of a sports car. A platoon of company sappers boarded a bus and they gave the impression that the whole war no longer concerned them. Although much of our equipment was still on the north shore of the Gulf, the battalion was nevertheless motorised and moving along the roads of the Peloponnese. But I was not satisfied with the speed. Having caught up with the second company of the first reconnaissance battalion, I rushed as fast as possible toward Corinth. My intuition told me that the British had already gone south. 
Our limousine raced frantically along the washed-out road along the coast. The small fishing villages looked dormant and abandoned in the blazing southern sun. As we passed another small village just around the corner, I saw a car speeding down the road toward the farmstead. Here we were on a par with it. My comrades in arms, shouting Tommy, raised their guns with lightning speed. I cast another glance at this Tommy and saw in his hands a German Mr. 38 automatic rifle. I also noticed the helmet of a German parachutist. The parachutists also recognized us and lowered their automatic rifles. They, too, at first mistook us for British. After a few more minutes, my entire company arrived and made contact with the second parachute and airborne company. Colonel Strum began to pursue the British in a southerly direction. We immediately turned around and raced back to Patras. The night shadows were already descending on the ground. Meanwhile, the 3rd Battalion of the Motorized Brigade of the SS Lebstand de Adolf Hitler also crossed the Gulf of Patricos and began to pursue the British, who were retreating to the south of the Peloponnese. There was a machinist in this battalion. He fired up the locomotive furnace at Petras and drove the battalion south by rail along the western shore of the peninsula. Late at the brigade command post that day, I met a now friendly-looking Sepp Dietrich. Everyone was silent as I reported to him about making contact with the paratroopers. With a chuckle, he extended his hand to me and said in his Bavarian dialect, Hey Kurt, yesterday I thought you were crazy. Now I take that back. That was brilliant. Tell me how you came up with that crazy idea. I could see my adjutant behind me already marking new passages on our map and keeping glancing at his watch. I had barely had time to give Sepp Dietrich the information he needed before he gave me a new assignment. The battalion was to reassemble and, while continuing to pursue the enemy, to reconnoiter in the direction of Kalumata through Pyrgos, Olympia, and Tr My comrades lay in ditches on both sides of the road and slept like dead men. Meanwhile, new armoured vehicles and other vehicles had arrived. The battalion was again ready for the operation. Before dawn, our movement to the south of the Peloponnese began. Countless British vehicles lined the road. The British had to abandon them for lack of fuel. Some of the spoils came in very handy for us. We even found intact armoured personnel carriers and small Bren machine guns on them. The Greeks at Pyrgos welcomed us with wine and subtropical fruit. I interrupted traffic at Olympia and took my soldiers to the famous ancient Greek stadium. The mayor of Pyrgos took us through the classical arena and did not forget to show us the monument to Hinrich Schliemann. For over an hour we wandered the stone-strewn ground, marvelling at the amazing mosaics and impressive structures of this historic site. At Tripolis we joined up with army units attacking the British in the southern ports. SS der Untersturmführer SETD commander of a reconnaissance group on armoured vehicles returning from Kalamata, reported there is a defeat of the enemy who was in an impasse between fire and water. The battle in Greece was virtually over.